Good morning. Good morning. Welcome. It's good to see each of you here. How many of you enjoy this uh, change in the weather? Isn't that awesome? Uh-huh. I love it. I went out for a walk this morning, and I had to turn around and go get me a little hoodie because it said 60 degrees on my phone. I just couldn't handle it. So I, I love that little coolness. It's great. All right. Well, we're in uh, Acts chapter 19. If you have a Bible, you can turn there. We're going to be wrapping up our series in the book of Acts today. So we got our bookshelf. Just as a reminder, we're going through all 66 books in a five-year period. Uh, Next week, we start in the book of Esther, which is going to be up on that next uh, shelf there. Um, No, top shelf. Last book of the top shelf, the book of Esther. Thank you. So here we are around graduation time. We started this series. Acts has 28 chapters, and we've only been able to cover it for six weeks. And it's been an amazing series for the last six weeks. Let me just review where we've been, uh, because Acts is amazing. 28 chapters. We started in chapter 1 with the resurrection and the uh, uh, Jesus spending 40 days with his disciples teaching them about the kingdom of God, giving them a commission. I want you to go, and you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth, which that's what we read in the book of Acts. Then in chapter 2, we have the believers praying and the Holy Spirit coming in power, and uh, people were able to speak the languages of the foreigners that were there and share the good news of the gospel. And Peter gets up and preaches a sermon 3,000 people are saved and then are baptized. And so we had a baptism during the first service, which we're very excited. You may be able to see my arm is still a little bit wet from uh, that that baptism. So that's um, what happened in Acts chapter 2. And then in Acts chapter 9, we saw the persecutor of the church become now the church planter. Paul meets Jesus on the road to Damascus and is radically changed. And then we read in chapter 10 where Peter takes the message of the gospel to this Roman household of Cornelius and his whole household was saved. Now these were Gentiles and so the gospel was moving uh, in Jerusalem, Judea as the, the scripture said. And then on Mother's Day we looked at the different women of the church. We looked at Mary, the mother of Jesus, praying in the upper room before Pentecost. We looked at Mary Uh, John Mark's mother, who had a church in her home, hosting a prayer meeting at midnight. Uh, We we saw that. We saw a servant girl named Rhoda, whose name means Rose, uh, who knew Peter personally and and met him at the gate after God uh, did a miracle there. And then we have uh, uh, Dorcas, who used her sewing for the glory of God. Lydia, who was a wealthy businesswoman, hosted a church in her home in Corinth. And then we have Priscilla, the teacher of teachers, who uh, was a partner with Paul in church planting. So we've had a great run in the book of Acts. And then last week in chapter 15, we saw the the opposition from within, where as believers were coming to Christ and a lot of Gentiles were coming, people said, Jewish people, the Pharisees said, well, what needs to happen is you need to be circumcised and follow the law of Moses before you're saved. So they had to work through that conflict of how do we have salvation. And you may remember from last week, uh, Peter spoke, and it's so true. He says, it's by the grace of God through faith in Jesus Christ. By the grace of God through faith in Jesus Christ. It's not our works. It's not religion. It's not something that we do. It is faith in Christ and Christ alone. So that was last week. Now today, we're going to look at opposition opposition. The, the, the church continues to grow, and then there's opposition. We'll be looking at that today. Would you join me as we pray before we get into our word? Let us pray. Father, thank you for each one that's here. Thank you for those who are watching online. Lord, we're grateful for all these wonderful things that we're seeing in the book of Acts. Uh, we're seeing you move powerfully in people's hearts and in people's lives, uh, changing people prejudices, uh, radically affecting uh, communities and religious structures. And Lord, we know that that same power also changes our lives and uh, affects our families and our communities. And we, uh, we, we want to pray for the power that we have and the change that we have to begin to impact others around us. So speak to us today from your word, Lord, and help us to be uh, your salt and your light uh, to the world around us. In Jesus' name we pray. 
Amen. All right, Acts chapter 19, as we wrap up today. We start in verse 17 is what I have on the outline. There's so much in chapter 19, I couldn't fit it all on the outline. So we start in chapter 17, which means I'm going to have to read back uh, to catch us up. It said the story. Oh, boy, what story? Well, I have to read the story that Acts 19.17 is talking about. So here earlier in chapter 19, Paul's on his missionary journey. He finds himself in Ephesus. In Ephesus, he goes to the synagogue, and I'm starting in verse uh, 8. And so he's in the synagogue, and he's preaching uh, for three months, arguing persuasively about the kingdom of God. But some became stubborn, or some of your translations have become hardened. I think that's an interesting Greek word because it says that it's a process of hardening. And so these people were hardened and stubborn, and it just continued to where they became so hard that they were like rock hard. And so because of this stubbornness that continued to grow in them, they rejected the message and began publicly speaking against the way. You're going to see this word, the way, used over and over and over in the book of Acts. That's one way that they would describe Christianity is the way. Isn't that a great description of Christianity, the way? Wasn't it Jesus who said, I am the way, the truth, and the life? No one comes to the Father except through me. So anytime we start saying that there is one way and one way only, and it's through Jesus, that's not a popular message. And that's going to bring opposition. And that's going to bring anger and frustration. And so as we unpack this chapter, we're going to see a lot of that coming to a head, but this had been happening all through the book of Acts. There had been growth and opposition, growth and opposition, and you'll see this in your own life. As you grow spiritually, you will face opposition from the enemy. If you're trying to do something good for God, the enemy is going to come against you hard. In fact, someone has said before that if, uh, if you're cruising along and you haven't had a head-on collision with the devil lately, you might be going the same direction as him. So opposition was part of it. So Paul faced opposition in the synagogue, so it made him move. And so he moved to this a new place to hold church. Uh, it was called the School of Tyrannus. And so Paul would, would hold church and his lectures and his preaching and his teaching there at this School of Tyrannus. And so he uh, left the synagogue, took the believers with him. They held daily discussions at the lecture hall of Tyrannus. So he does a rented out space probably, or maybe he knew Tyrannus, and the guy let him use the building. We don't know, but this went on for the next two years. So of all of Paul's journeys, he spends the most time in Ephesus, and it had a lot of fruit. So it said this went on for two years. I'm reading from chapter uh, 19, verse 10. Two years, so the people throughout the province of Asia, both Jews and Gentiles, heard the word of the Lord. So because of Paul, because of the ministry, because of the believers, it says that everyone in that entire region heard the word of the Lord. So now they've been faced with this truth that every one of us have to deal with. When you hear about the gospel of Jesus Christ, you, there's, you, you must make a decision. There's no neutral ground now. Once you know about Jesus, you, you have to decide, what do I do about this? Do I... Accept him as Lord, or do I deny him, get angry, and then continue to go my own way? That's our choice. So this made some people angry, but the, the good news was that the word of God had gone out. Now, as a church, in our early days, we took this very seriously. This is called gospel saturation. We want to try to saturate our community as a new church. And so we would. I went down to the post office, and I found every route... And we sent out mailers to every route in Leander. And so we were regularly five, six times a year mailing out mailers, inviting people to come to church. And then we were out in the community uh, meeting people. We would also uh, map out the neighborhoods. And we would go out and uh, have door hangers. And so we would be inviting people that way. So they would get our mailers in the mail. They would get our door hangers. They would see our stickers. Uh, they would see our different events that we had. And, uh, you know, we, we, we would say things like this. We want to make it hard for people to go to hell in Leander. Amen. Right? They can't say, well, I didn't know. I was never invited to church. I don't know about this Jesus person because we wanted to put it out there. And so we continue to take this seriously, and we still send out mailers. We can't send out as many as, as we used to. Well, because the, the area has grown so much. You realize just that in a five-mile radius, we, it's a 20,000 mailers. It's incredible. 
So there's a lot of folks. But we will be at the Old Town Festival. We made announcements about that. So we'll be able to talk to thousands of people at the Old Town. We'll be giving away balloons. We'll be giving away cold water for free. We'll have all of our brochures and our invite cards, and we'll talk to people. We'll pray with people. We'll invite people. So this is just some of the things that we do as a church to get out there and try to interact with people. So these invite cards that you have, these are a great opportunity for you when a spiritual conversation comes up to say, here, I want to invite you to my church. It's got everything they need, times, website, map. And it's amazing how many times God will open the door for a spiritual conversation for you to be able to give them an invite card. So we still want to see gospel penetration in our city. And the same thing happens in, in Jero as well. So they saw this. Paul and the believers, everyone had heard. God also gave Paul the power to perform, and Luke uses the word unusual, because you know he's struggling with this. This is unusual, unusual miracles in that handkerchiefs and aprons that belonged to Paul were placed on people and they were either healed or evil spirits were expelled. So what this is talking about, see Paul was a tent maker and so he would be making tents and so what this literally means, it says handkerchiefs, but what it really was was a sweat rag. So as Paul's working there in the heat making tents, he'd have a, a rag to kind of wipe his brown, he'd set that rag down. He also had an apron that he would work with to kind of keep his clothes. And just imagine every day Paul's coming in, it's like, what happened to my, my pile of rags? You know, they're gone and what happened to my, my apron? I got to get another apron, dadgummit. People were taking his stuff, and they were saying, in the name of Jesus, you know, and, and they were using this stuff as these little trinkets and this little part of their sorcery. See that the city of Ephesus was overrun with idolatry, sorcery, witchcraft. All this stuff was going on around, and so you have this major spiritual warfare that's going on. So here's what happens. The gospel was being proclaimed, lives were changing, the strongholds of the enemy were being taken over, verse 11, no I'm sorry, I'm, I'm down now to verse 14, 13, a group of Jews traveling from town to town uh, casting out evil spirits, and so there was these people that made money from going around doing exorcisms. So these guys, they'd have their spells, they'd have their incantations, they'd have their little tricks, they'd have all their little stuff that they would do, <clears throat> charge money for it. So this was lucrative. They, uh, they tried to use the name of Jesus in their incantation. So they had these little spells or the incantations. So they would throw Jesus in as kind of like a little way to help them out. Like, oh, we've heard about this great name of Jesus and what's it doing in people's lives. We'll just throw that into our little spell list. This was a disaster. They tried to use the name of Jesus, incantation, uh, commanding um, someone, a demon to come out in Jesus' name. Seven sons of Sceva, verse 14, a leading priest, were doing this. And so these seven sons of this Jewish priest were involved in this sorcery and, and the exorcisms. But one of the evil spirits replied, Jesus, I know. Meaning that the demon knew who Jesus was. That's exactly what we see from Scripture. Christ created all the, the creatures, angels and demons included, and so they know him. James says that the demons know God and they tremble. When Jesus appeared on the scene, the demons knew exactly who he was, and they freaked out. Oh, my gosh, please, you know, are you going to send us to hell? Oh, please, send us over to those pigs. Christ had complete authority over any kind of an evil spirit. They were subject to him completely. So these guys are saying, all right, you know, come out of this, come out of him in Jesus' name. And the demon, Luke says that the demon spoke to them. I know who Jesus is. I know him well. That's what the Greek word means. I know him very well. And I know Paul. And so the word is that he knows him not as well as Jesus, but he knows him. Paul had been stirring things up, and so the demons were aware of Paul's ministry. Uh, Do the demons know your name? Are you stirring up the kingdom so much that they, you got their attention? So they, they, the, the demon says that, I know Jesus, and I know Paul, but who are you? And then the demon began to kick their tails. And it says that they ran out naked 
and bleeding. And you can just see this house, and all of a sudden these people are diving out the windows or running out the doors, half-dressed, claw marks all over them. They got their tails kicked by this one guy. So this story of how this demon attacked these sorcerers, word got out. So that's where we're starting with today, Acts 19, verse 17. The story of what happened spread quickly all through Ephesus to the Jews and the Greeks alike. A solemn fear descended on the city, and the name of the Lord Jesus Christ was greatly honored. Wouldn't you love that? If a solemn fear fell on Leander and Round Rock and Cedar Park and Liberty Hill, and, and, and people feared God, and Jesus was greatly honored. Wouldn't that be amazing? So the name of the Lord Jesus was greatly honored. Many who became believers. Y'all help me out. What does it say? Many who became believers did what? They confessed their sinful practices. See, this is what is necessary for transformation. Personal transformation. Family transformation. Community transformation. It's a confession of sin. 1 John 1, 9 says, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. But it starts with confession. If we don't confess, then we're just playing games. That's what I'm saying. When we come face to face with Jesus, face to face with the gospel, we've got to do something about that. We either say, okay, I'm a sinner in need of a savior, or we can hold it at arm's distance apart and go, well, yeah, let me, I'm thinking about it. I'm thinking about it. I'm agnostic. I'm not sure you got to make a decision, and when you make the decision, then you must confess your sins. That's what they did. They confessed their sins. We are involved in idolatry. We are involved in witchcraft. We have been involved in this prostitution ring and all that stuff that they were doing, ripping people off, overcharging, all this stuff, whatever it was, they confessed it. Verse 19, they took it a step farther. And this may be what some of us need to do. Not only do we confess, but we need to clean house. Verse 19, look at this. A number of them who've been practicing sorcery. This was a major source of income for a lot of people. They would go around having these spells and these tricks, black magic, white magic, tea leaves, astrology, all this crazy stuff that they were doing. And, and they'd have these expensive books with these little spells that they would read out. When they were convicted and changed their heart for Jesus, they said, I don't need that anymore. I don't need witchcraft and spells and this kind of stuff. I've got Jesus. I've got a far greater power. And that's Jesus Christ. So when Christ changes our lives, some things have to be thrown away, discarded of, gotten rid of. They're just garbage. Paul says, I count it all as rubbish to know Christ. So it says that they had uh, brought their incantation books. And this is beautiful, too. You could have taken that book that's worth a lot of money and sold it to someone else and, and made some profit. But why would you want to sell a, lot, a bunch of lies for someone else to deceive other people with. So that's a true change when you realize, I don't care how much it costs. I don't care how much I paid for it. That doesn't matter. I'm done with that. That's a sign of true life change. So they brought their incantation books. They burned them at a public bonfire. And here, I thought the Aggies were the first people that had a bonfire. Oh, no. They got the bonfire going here in Ephesus. And what are they burning? They're burning these incantation, witchcraft, sorcery books. The value of the books, you'll help me out. How, what was the value of the books? Several million dollars. Wow! And different translations will have different things, but that's a lot of money. And they didn't, they didn't bat an eye. Listen, man, Jesus changed my life. I don't need that anymore. What do you need to throw away out of your life? What do you need to get rid of? In what ways do you need to clean house. Whenever I was a teenager and Christ really got a hold of my life, um, I, I did something similar. In fact, for my 20-year uh, celebration, my dad came up. And it was called, we had a roasting, and so everyone told stories about me, and my dad got up here and told stories about how whenever I got serious for the Lord, I was burning my Judas Priest and Scorpions and all this kind of stuff album, and he, he claimed that I burned some of his Merle Haggard and Willie Nelson's uh, records. I don't remember doing that, but that's what he said. But uh, anyway, what do you need to get rid of? What's holding you back from living for the Lord? As a pastor, there are times where I've had to, and I love doing this. Hey, we're in a new house. Can you come bless the house? And so I'll, I'll go in and, 
and we'll, we'll hold hands and we'll pray in Jesus' name for the house to be blessed and for the Lord to, you know, his presence to be known there and for there to be peace and joy and all that kind of stuff. And, and, and what a great thing, right? This house belongs to the Lord. And so we're going to acknowledge that and we're going to pray for his blessing and peace upon this house. So I'll do that. But I had someone, uh, this has happened a couple times, but one particular that stands out to me, a lady that went to our church, her sister or sister-in-law, she contacted me and said, our house has a lot of turmoil. Our house just is just ugly. And there's just, my kids wake up terrified. Uh, things fall off the walls. Things uh, move and, and they'll fall off a table. And she was describing like this kind of a chaotic, horrific, evil kind of presence in her house. And, and when I walked in, I was like, oh, wow, I understand what's going on now. She had like Buddhas sitting there and like these totem poles and these faces of these different gods and idols and all this kind of stuff all around her house was covered with this like idol worship kind of a stuff and I thought oh that that that's what it is and so we sat down at the table and I said um, do you really want to see a change in your in your in your household and and she was like yes I do I'll do anything I, I can't live this way anymore and I said all right well here's the first thing you need to do you number one you need to accept Jesus Christ all right you accept Jesus Christ because when Christ comes into our lives, everything changes. And there's no room for anything evil when Christ comes in. He drives it out. That's what the, 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 the story of the New Testament. When Christ showed up at the scene, man, the demons scattered. And when Christ comes into your life, you now have the presence and the power of God Almighty living in your heart and your life. And so Paul... When writing to the Ephesians, he says, Be strong in the Lord and his mighty power. Put on God's armor that you will be able to stand firm against the strategies of the devil. For we are not fighting against flesh and blood, but against evil rulers and authorities in high places in the unseen world. Therefore, take God's armor and put it on you. Take the helmet of salvation, the breastplate of righteousness, the belt of truth. All these things are our weapons of our warfare. We have all that we need to live the life that Christ has called us to live. If you have Christ, you have all that you need. So that's number one. And so she accepted Christ. And then the second thing I said, well, you need to take all this stuff and, and get rid of it. And so she did. She took a garbage bag, and she got rid of all that stuff. And it was a pretty large garbage bag of stuff, and she hauled it away. And guess what? She had peace in her house. The kids could sleep. There was a marked difference because they removed the idols. And so I'd ask you, what do you need to remove from your life? What needs to be thrown away? What needs to be burnt? What bonfire do we need to have so that we can say, enough of that, now I live for Jesus? And, and it's got to happen. So point number one, Christ transforms communities. How does he transform communities? By transforming lives first. These people confessed their sinful practices. They got rid of whatever was holding them down, and now they're living for the Lord, and that has tremendous power. Confession, the gospel has tremendous power when we take it seriously. So the message about the Lord spread widely and had a powerful effect. When God's people start living as God's people, it has a powerful effect, and it transforms communities. How many of you would like to see our community transformed, our nation transformed? It starts with us. It starts with us confessing our sins. It starts with us trusting God, not sorcery or Aladdin's lamp or tea leaves or the economy or whatever it may be. We trust the Lord, and we live for the Lord. That brings transformation to our lives, to our families' lives, and it has a powerful effect. Verse 23, at that time, serious trouble developed in Ephesus concerning the way. So there it is again, the way. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And so that was one of the ways that Christianity was described as the way. It was also, they were also called Christians, which means little Christ. Those are great descriptions of who we are. Yes, we should be like little Christ. We should be about the way. There's not many ways. There's 
the way. So now serious trouble is developing in Ephesus concerning the way. It began with Demetrius. And who's Demetrius? It says he's a silversmith who had a large business manufacturing silver shrines of the Greek goddess Artemis. So in, in Ephesus, there was this massive temple to Artemis. The Romans called her Diana. Artemis was this, this temple in Ephesus was one of the seven original wonders of the world. So you think about the pyramids. That's one of the seven wonders that's still around. This was another one. Massive, incredible, huge marble columns surrounding it. It was a place of worship. And Artemis was pictured as a woman with all, she was covered in breasts. And so if you look at these little figurines that they've dug up, it just kind of looks silly, all these little bumps all over her. But she was this fertility goddess. And so when they would go to worship her, there was prostitution and, and nakedness and all kinds. Of, it would not be a place where kids would need to hang out. It would be a, a bad place to go. So the, but, but guess what? Because of the power of the gospel, this kind of thing was, uh, there were less and less people going to visit the temple and less and less people buying these manufactured little gods. And so along with the books being burned, I'm sure people were taking this little silver thing of Artemis. They go, I don't need that. Why do I need Artemis when I got Jesus, right? I don't need that. And so they're throwing it away, and they're seeing their business literally implode. Wouldn't that be amazing if the power of the gospel spread so much that strip clubs are shutting down? The pornography industry just dies because nobody wants to look at that anymore. Wow. That's the power of the gospel, and that's exactly what's happening right here. So he, uh, he kept many other craftsmen busy. So this guy might be the first union boss. And so he gathers all his people together and goes, all right, listen, guys, we got a big problem. And so he's having this union meeting, and he's like, all right, you know, uh, gentlemen, you know that our wealth comes from, from this business. Now that's first and foremost what the problem was. They were losing money. Anytime you start losing money, it gets people's attention. And they were losing money. But who cares about that? What if you go around saying, oh, but, but I'm not making as much money as I used to make. Most people are like, yeah, whatever. You know, you'll, you'll be okay. So he didn't go with this whole poor me, I'm losing money. He starts trying to stir people up deeper. So he says, not only does our wealth come, verse 28, but you've seen and heard this man, Paul. Oh, now here, here's how you really stir things up. Pick out someone and, and, and make them a villain. We don't like this, pe this person or these people. And, and you can hold up that as this terrible thing. And, and all your anger and aggression can be targeted toward that person or this group of people. Oh, this Paul person. He's making us poor. This Paul person. He's ruining our business. This Paul person. All of our problems in Ephesus are because of Paul and what he's teaching. So you can see this is a real problem because Paul uh, could be strung up and, and killed here. And all the, the people that were Christians could be in a lot of trouble. So that's why there was serious trouble brewing. People were angry because life change was happening and they didn't like it. And when life change happens, it, it affects things, doesn't it? And sometimes you just have to come to the point where, you know what? I don't care what it affects. We must change. William Wilberforce, in, in, in the early 1800s, when he was going before Parliament... He and a lot of people had been praying, and they had this conviction that the slave trade had to stop. The slave, we can't be taking people, enslaving them, and then selling them. That is not right. And so God's people said, enough. But you know what some of the biggest like, pushbacks were? They said, we we're going to be losing 27 million pounds of revenue. Wow, that's a lot of money. If you think about 27 million back in the 1800s, that's like billions. But the people of God and the people decided, you know what? It doesn't matter how much money we're making. That is not right, and it must stop, right? And so we, there has to come a time where we draw a line in the sand and say, it doesn't matter if I'm making money by being a, a, a thief and lying and stealing. That has to stop. I can't live that way anymore. I've got to follow the Lord. So now you have this tension of these, these like worldviews happening. We want to get rich off of selling these little idols, but people are saying, no, we don't want that anymore. 
So they're angry about it. So deep down inside, their pocketbooks were being affected, but they're stirring up the people. So Paul is saying the handmade gods aren't really gods at all. He's attacking our, our heritage and our history, and man, this guy is messing things up. And he's not only done this here in Ephesus, but throughout the entire providence. Of course, I'm not just talking about the loss of public respect for our business. So all of our businesses are affected. I'm talking about the temple, our beloved temple, and our great goddess. So now they're making this so personal that oh, our very temple's at stake and our very goddess is at stake. And, and, and it's kind of silly if you think about it. If Artemis is so great, why does she need to be defended by these silversmiths? If Artemis is so wonderful and the whole world knows that, then why does she need defending? But they're stirring people's emotions. So Artemis is going to lose the influence and this magnificent goddess worship throughout the province of Asia and all around the world. So the whole sky is falling down. Everything is horrible because of these Christians and because of Paul. And, and she'll be robbed of her great privilege. They also saw Artemis as like a mother figure. So this was like a fertility goddess. And so, you know, anytime someone says something bad against your mom, you get really mad, right? So they were like, Paul's attacking mama. You know, everyone get all upset about this. He's attacking our business. He's attacking our, our city. And he's attacking mama. So their anger boiled. See, what a great speech this was. Man, this guy stirred up an angry mob. And so you have a riot now that has broken out. So we think riots are something, you know, modern day, don't we? No, no, no. This goes way back in time. People get riotous and angry and emotionally charged, yelling, shouting. I wonder if they were turning over chariots and firebombing the tent-making businesses. I don't know what they were doing, but man, you got a full-blown riot on your hands because this one guy stirred the pot. So if you were a sociologist studying what causes riots, well, here's you a great case study right here. It says, soon the whole city was filled with confusion. Isn't that what happens when rioting happens? Like, man, what's going on around here? Everything's on fire and everybody's all mad. What's going on? So the whole city is filled with confusion. Everyone rushed into the amphitheater. So now you have this huge crowd that gathers in the amphitheater there in Ephesus. And they're yelling and they're screaming. And look, we pick up. And so point number two, the message of Jesus causes opposition. It causes opposition. People are not going to like it. That's just part of it. We've seen this all through the book of Acts. Opposition from Herod, the government, seizing James, having him killed, seizing Peter. Peter's head was on the chopping block. The church prayed. Peter was released. Opposition in the form of religion coming against. you got to be circumcised or you're not saved, and so you got internal opposition, external opposition, community opposition, business opposition. All kinds of different opposition can come against Christianity because that's what happens. We have opposition. So they started shouting and again and kept it up for two hours. This is what they were shouting. Great is Artemis of the Ephesians. Great is Artemis of the Ephesians. So they're just yelling that for two hours straight. Wouldn't you get tired of yelling that after a while? I, I can't imagine. I guess you got to be pretty fired up, pretty angry, pretty emotional uh, to go to all that trouble and stand there yelling for two hours. Finally, verse 35 of Voice of Reason, the mayor was able to quiet them down long enough to speak. Citizens of Ephesus, this is a, what a great politician. All right, you guys listen up. Time for me to talk. Everyone knows that Ephesus is the official guardian of the temple and of, of the great Artemis whose image fell down to us from heaven. They believed the big meteor fell and that they formed this uh, idol of Artemis from this meteor. That's what they, they believed. And so um, since this is an undeniable fact, you should stay calm. And do not do anything rash. In other words, y'all stop this rioting stuff. This is getting dangerous here. You have brought these men here, but they have stolen nothing from the temple and have not spoken against our goddess. If Demetrius and the craftsmen have a case against them, the courts are in session and the officials can hear the case at once. Let them make formal charges. And if there are any complaints about these matters, they can be settled with legal assembly. So he's saying, listen, let's use the courts, let's use our minds, let's do things right. All this crazy emotion is not helping anybody. Verse 40, he nails it right here. He says, for I'm afraid we are in danger of being charged with rioting by the Roman government. That's one thing that Rome did not 
put up with. They would rush in soldiers, military presence, and it could be bad. And so he was afraid of losing their free status as a city. He was afraid of there being a military occupation. He was afraid of all kinds of things bad to happen. So he's like, listen, guys, you've got to cool it because we're on the verge of being in a lot of trouble. So what was happening here was, this is point number three, a crisis of belief. A crisis of belief. Christ is going to create a crisis of belief in all of us. When it comes to Christ, do I accept him? Do I not accept him? Do I follow him? Do I not follow him? What do I do with Jesus? And people that are living for Jesus, other people are not going to like that. And they're not going to appreciate that. They're like, oh, you're some religious nut. You're some crazy person. I can't believe you do that. I can't believe you act like that. We will face people not understanding our devotion for Jesus Christ. And so it creates a crisis of belief for us and for others as they watch us live. It's hard for them. So what do we do? Well, the church must continue to grow. People must continue to be transformed. And so we live out our faith knowing that there will be trials and tribulation. Jesus says, in this world, you will have trials and tribulation. That is a guarantee, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. So we continue to live for Jesus, pray to Jesus, and spread the good news because that's what he has told us to do. So in Ephesus, God had moved mightily, and now the enemy is moving against them. You know, in our country, we have a history of God moving in big ways, and I want to share with you some of those ways. How many of you are, are ready to see some changes around in our country and in our community? Uh, do you realize that God has done some amazing things? And I want to share with you some of these things that have happened in our country, just so you can be aware that uh, we have what's called a revival heritage in our country, a revival heritage. See, the, the, uh, the pilgrims that left and, and they sailed over here, they had a vision of living for God, and so they, they, they crafted this uh, Mayflower Compact. Uh, do you realize that when the people uh, moved in to, to start uh, Pennsylvania, William Penn and the Quakers, when they moved to Pennsylvania, this is what they said. Uh, we want that people would be self-governing from within by the law of God, by an inner moral compass guided by the New Testament. That's what the founders of Pennsylvania said. Wow. And so I want to just share with you some things from, uh, it's a book by Eddie Hyatt it's called America's Revival Heritage. America's Revival Heritage. And it talks about the fact that people have a discussion did our founders plan on America being a Christian nation? And so we, we, there's discussion about that. I don't know. There's a lot of, you know, inscriptions, and it says in God we trust, and, and one nation under God, indivisible. I mean, it's all around us, but, and so there's discussion. Well, here's one thing that, that is a fact, is that there was a massive revival that broke out in the 1700s that left a radical mark on every single founder. And this was called the First Great Awakening. And it happened from 1720 to 1760. And it happened with preaching and prayers and fasting. And uh, Jonathan Edwards was one of the, the leading preachers during this time, and uh, this is what, how it's described in one of the accounts that someone said. It says that God invaded the town of Northampton. This is in Massachusetts. The town seemed to be full of the presence of God. Bars emptied out, and Edwards' home, Jonathan Edwards' home, as well as other Christians, their homes were filled with people asking, how do I get saved? Isn't that amazing? What if you said people just come to your house and said, tell me, how do, I, how do I find Jesus? What an amazing thing that God was doing. And so visitors to the town spoke with amazement about the holy atmosphere that was blanketing the town. Uh, this is what Edward says. He says, if you came across someone who seemed spiritually indifferent, that would have been a strange thing. So no one was indifferent. Everyone was either 
on fire or left town. <laughs> George Whitfield brought his sermons to America. He was a like an outdoor preacher, kind of like one of the first Billy Grahams. George Whitfield uh, would gather crowds in the 1700s between 10,000 to 30,000 people. Can you imagine? 30,000 people without a microphone were listening to the preaching of George Whitfield. When George Whitfield was in Philadelphia, guess whose home he stayed in? Benjamin Franklin. And he stayed in Benjamin Franklin's home. And this is what Franklin writes about that time period. He says, uh, from being thoughtless or indifferent about religion, it seemed like the whole world was growing religious so that no one could walk through town in an evening without hearing psalms sung by different families on every street. Can you imagine that? Walking through Philadelphia and, and you're hearing people singing uh, and, and, and quoting psalms all throughout the town. That was the power of what had happened during that great awakening. And so... Um, Whitfield had a prayer that people heard him say. Guess what his prayer said? Here, here, if this sounds familiar to you, this was Whitfield's prayer. He says, I pray that they would not live as 13 scattered colonies, but as one nation under God. Have you heard that before? That was the prayer of George Whitfield back in the 1700s. Amazing. And so that was his prayer, one nation under God. So this great awakening began to impact every single person that was there. In fact, Thomas Jefferson, uh, every time that he would have a presidential document, he would write, in the year of our Lord Jesus Christ, on government documents. Thomas Jefferson actually gave money so that there could be missionaries sent to American Indian tribes. Here's a government official endorsing missionary things. So much for this whole separation of church and state that they tried to tack on to Jefferson. And so we have this entire movement of God affecting all of the founders. When the Constitutional Convention met in 1787, the delegates fought and bickered. Doesn't that sound like today? Yeah. Fighting and bickering. So it's very common. This group believes this, this group believes that. So you fight, name call, bickering. And it almost broke up, and the whole thing was a whole disaster. But Benjamin Franklin stood up, and this is what he said. He said, the longer I live, the more convincing proofs I see that God governs the affairs of men. And if a sparrow cannot fall to the ground without his notice, is it probable that an empire can rise without his aid? And so he asked the delegates there to pray together at the start of every meeting. And after prayer, an atmosphere of peace came over the room. And they were able to hammer out the American Constitution and the Bill of Rights by starting with prayer. Wow. So that's the effect of the Great Awakening on our founding fathers. And that's not the only time that we've had this Great Awakening in our country. We also have what's called a Second Great Awakening that happened in 1734 through 43. And um, this was also another huge movement. Um, the Second Great Awakening, let me just read to you a little bit about that. Uh, Charles Finney was a part of that. He was the one who popularized the Come Forward invitation that has kind of been used by Billy Graham. And uh, there was 100,000 people that gave their hearts to Jesus Christ in Rochester, New York alone. And so this uh, revival spread to over 1,500 towns during the Second Great Awakening of 1800 to 1840. There was also what's called the Businessmen's Revival of 1867 to 18, 1857 to 1858, where there was a guy that was hired. His name was Jeremiah Lampier. He was hired by a church in New York City because they said they were concerned about the anxious faces on the, of the businessmen in New York. Businessmen in New York were just walking around like they, they just had they had no hope at all. So they began this prayer movement, and so they would open churches, and uh, they would have. And so it's also called the Great Prayer Meeting. And over one million people were added to the church rolls during this church uh, businessmen's revival. Uh, Urban revival of 1875. A guy by the name of D. L. Moody. He was the forerunner of, of Billy Graham. He would gather hundreds of thousands of people and he would preach to them. And he was considered the greatest preacher and soul winner of his generation. And so uh, through the ministry of D.L. Moody, lots and lots of people were reached for the gospel. 
uh, the post-World War II awakening. Uh, ever heard of a guy by the name of Bill Bright who started Campus Crusade for Christ? How about a guy by the name of Billy Graham? Have you all heard of Billy Graham? Have you all ever heard Billy Graham preach? Yeah, I went to uh, his crusade in San Antonio. And uh, so, yeah, so Billy Graham was able to speak to millions of people and millions watched him on the TV. So this was also another awakening where many, many people came to the Lord. Uh, the Jesus Movement. Have you ever heard of the Jesus Movement? This happened in the late 1960s to early 1970s. This was a revival where young people uh, decided to take the Bible at face value and emphasize turning from drugs, sex, and politics to Jesus. Uh, how many of you know we would think we need another Jesus movement today? <laughs> Let's turn from sex, drugs, and politics to the Lord at face value. And so they decided to do that, and it had a, it had a huge impact. In fact, we saw a movie at the theater called The Jesus Music. And The Jesus Music, they say that that came out of the Jesus movement. So it spawned this entire movement of the contemporary Christian music that we listen to today came out of that Jesus movement. So we've seen these things happen in our country. Promise keepers, this is one of the latest thing that they've, they've labeled. Promise keepers happened in the 1990s. How many of you have ever been to a promise keepers event or heard about promise keepers? Anybody? I went to one of the events there at the Dallas Cowboy Stadium and that thing was packed full of men praising the Lord, hearing messages. We were down on our knees praying, holding hands incredible what God was doing to the men in our country through promise keepers. Uh, also, this hit a high point in 1997 as a million men gathered at the National Mall in Washington, D.C. to pray. So these are some of the awakenings that we've had in our country. How many of you are ready for something else? Anybody? It happens with spiritual decay. It happens when there's apathy. It happens when there's a lack of hope. It happens when God's people begin to pray fervently. We begin to pray. We begin to confess our sins. These are the marks of revival. We're desperate. We pray. We fast. We confess sins. The Holy Spirit begins to work, and it begins to bring conviction and transformation on those around us. Let me pray as we close our service today. Father, thank you for the power of your word. Thank you for the power of Christ that changes lives. Lord, I pray for each person that's here today. If we need to confess sin, Lord, I pray that we would confess sin. If we need to get rid of something in our lives, Lord, I pray that we would get rid of it. Have a bonfire in our backyard. Lord, if we need to uh, be serious, Lord, about prayer, Lord, I pray that we would all join together in praying for our nation. Lord, we pray for conviction of sin. Lord, we pray that you would change the leaders of our nation, change their hearts, it, it, it bring conviction of sin, Lord, that they would not lead us away from you, but closer to us. Lord, we pray that we would be one nation under God, indivisible. And so, Lord, I just pray that you would bring about a revival that starts with us, starts in our family, starts in our community, starts in this church. And, the Lord, I just pray that it has a reverberation, a, an effect on others. So thank you for the difference that you make. Thank you for what we've seen in the book of Acts. Lord, may we continue to take your message and live it out before others. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen.